Okay, so um, I'd like to begin by echoing Inagaki Sensei's uh, uh, appreciation of all of you being here today. We have, uh, of course, we have our keynote presenters who are from leading universities in the English speaking world, but we also have quite a few uh, attendees from institutions. For example, in East Asia, we have a contingent from Beijing University, we have East China Normal University, the Education University of Hong Kong, and others here, and we really appreciate it. Uh, although our panel today very much faces West, continues to face West, uh, we are committed to uh, facing East Asia as well, and we will uh, continue to do that in, in forthcoming symposiums. Um, and we're also pleased to have uh, those of you from major universities around Japan. We have uh, Tohoku University, Doshisha University, Ritsumeikan is here, uh, and Waseda. So uh, what I really want to underscore is that the success of this new global office depends just as much as what we do here in Kyoto as upon the quality of the dialogue that we have with like-minded researchers like you moving forward. So we thank you for making time to come to Kyoto on a Saturday and joining us in this emerging conversation. So uh, now my role today is just to speak for about 10 minutes uh, to outline the wider context of the work of the Global Office and, and the kind of environment that this panel is situated within. And I'm going to go ahead and read because some of it's uh, easier to do that way. Um, so I'll make a few introductory remarks uh, about our about the panel and then turn to introduce the three speakers and then turn the stage over to them. So the title of the symposium is A Japanese Model of Education Culture in a Global Era? Question <laughs> mark. Retrospect and Prospect. And what we are seeking to gesture to today is the fact that amidst our new global world of educational connectivity, there appears to be great potential in elaborating a Japanese model of education. The sudden rise of comparative global learning assessments, most famously the OECD PISA exercise, and the myriad ranking exercises such as the global education, uh, higher education rankings, has led to the increasing visibility of educational models outside Western Europe and North America. Yet at the same time, these instruments or policies tend to also push towards a worldwide homogenization of educational philosophy, policy, and practice. Within this context, the perennially high performance of Japanese students on global learning assessments, when understood as, merging, as emerging from a consistently different approach to education, potentially sets the stage for a substantive dialogue across educational cultures worldwide. The potential here is that the Japanese education model can form a counterpoint to dominant global trends. And we can well, well imagine a project that uses difference pragmatically to expand, in the face of the current contraction, our contemporary philosophical policy and practice horizon. Now, within Japanese domestic research circles, uh, this Turning to face the global era leads to a potentially seismic shift away from the catch-up discourse that has long dominated. And here I've shown an article by uh, Professor Karia that was just published in a fantastic volume edited by uh, Professor Yonizawa, who is here with us today. We can think in terms of replacing catch-up with a focus on difference, but again with difference understood as strategic rather than essential. Through the destabilization inherent in shifting away from the master frame of catch-up towards difference, long-standing domestic research projects can potentially grow in new ways. Indeed, the recent appearance of several major anthologies of Japanese philosophy, literature, and history underscore this wider trend towards going global with differences, rather than continuing the dominant post-war educational research path of seeking to erase that distinctiveness. Now, at the same time, we must acknowledge uh, the perils of a project predicated on difference. Attention to the Japanese model seems to imitate political turned policy discourses that see education as a potentially lucrative export good. And here I'm thinking of eduport. Thus failing to move beyond discussion of surface level differences. 
Another danger is that attention to difference is understood as a mere rehash of Nihon Jin Ron culturalist arguments made in the 1970s and 1980s, thus fixing Japanese culture as something homogenous, unchangeable, virtuous, and so on. So here the distinction between political discourses seeking to solidify a Japanese identity in a treacherous global world and research approaches seeking to elaborate difference threaten to become blurry and complementary. Similarly, the research focus on explaining difference can easily devolve into a sort of one-way project of introducing Japanese exotica to foreigners, not the sort of mutual defamiliarization emerging through substantive dialogue. Undoubtedly, then, considerable ambivalence pervades a project like we are trying to attempt. Yet, if we can agree that such a project can be fruitfully elaborated, perhaps Kyoto University is precisely the place to do it. Some of you will know the Kyoto School, names like Nishida, Tanabe, and Nishitani. Theirs was an approach of deep appreciation, fluency, and synthesis of Japanese, Western, and East Asian intellectual resources. And indeed, our faculty had already produced this volume, Education in the Kyoto School of Philosophy, Pedagogy for Human Transformation, in 2012. And several of the authors of this book are in attendance today, uh, Suzuki Sensei, Nishihira Sensei, and others. Now, this approach sets strong precedent, as does the Kyoto School's critical attitude towards purportedly Western, universalist Western concepts, for example, modernity, including educational modernity. At the same time, the refusal of the Kyoto School to stay at the empirical level and instead delve deep into the philosophical and perhaps even religious wellsprings of epistemic and ontological divergence gestures towards the another dimension of the approach that we hope to unfold in our project. So, against this backdrop, our symposium is envisioned as a first attempt, however inadequate it may be, to bring together the sorts of thinkers and perspectives from which new thoughts might emerge, to create a milieu out of which new knowledge and even new subjectivities can arise. As Dean Inagaki-sensei mentioned, we have today here three distinguished scholars of Japanese education from leading universities abroad, and we seek to showcase how they have grappled in their own careers with the question of the Japanese model of education and seek their advice about how to unfold this project and seek all of your advice as well in the panel discussion. So in preparing the symposium, uh, we asked the presenters to address these two general clusters of questions. How might the Japanese model project be undertaken? Should we seek new directions or new perspectives on older research themes? That was the first question. And the second question, what are the obstacles? What, are the, what is the potential and what are the pitfalls? And what, what kind of contribution would be enduring, something that goes beyond this project? We asked each of the presenters to think quite self-reflexively on their own experiences and share empirical examples from their own work. Each of them will have about 40 minutes to speak, and after the, we'll, that we'll have a short break, and then we'll have 60-minute panel discussion. Um, and we really do hope that the panel discussion becomes the first attempt to initiate that critical uh, conversation at the deeper level on the underlying issues that, that, this pro that this project is founded upon. Okay, so now uh, let me give a little bit more developed introduction to the three speakers that we have, um, just to follow up on what Inagaki Sensei said. Uh, and our first speaker is going to be uh, Professor Roger Goodman, someone who probably needs no introduction. Uh, he is perhaps, he has been a central pillar of Oxford University's Nissan Institute of Japanese Studies over the past several decades, and has more recently served as the Dean of Social Sciences at Oxford. He has written extensively on Japanese education since the 1980s, particularly from the perspective of social anthropology. I think it is clear that any, nearly anyone in the UK, Europe, and Australia who has written on contemporary Japanese education began by reading Roger Goodman's work, and I include myself here. I see Greg and, and Robert in the audience as well. Um, it might not be too much of an exaggeration to say that outside North America, Roger has been the most influential scholar of Japanese education over the past three decades. As such, we are so pleased that he accepted our offer to come to Kyoto, and we know that he's extremely busy. In a moment, we'll let Roger uh, tell us about his 
his own ideas in his own words, but I wanted to give my views on his work just very briefly, more as a way to surface some of the differences that this approach, that this panel uh, uh, is founded upon. So R Roger's empirical object has shifted dramatically uh, every few years, I would say, from Kikoku Shijio to Jido Gyaktai to higher education to youth problems to Kokusaika. Roger, Professor Goodman uh, consistently uses a range of empirical data to overturn reductionist political discourses and distorting culturalist analyses, showing us different ways of understanding the so-called problems and sense-making within Japanese society. Of the three panelists, I envisioned Roger as the most focused on how to make, as most focused on how Japanese make meaning of their lives, with discourses around education functioning as one window on that highly complex and constantly shifting discourseal formation. So thank you, Roger. Our second speaker is Joe Tobin. Uh, he's a professor at University of Georgia, as Inagak Sensei mentioned, but he's previously held appointments at the University of Hawaii and Arizona State. I just mentioned that Roger was perhaps the most influential scholar outside of North America over the past several decades within North America, but certainly not limited to North America. I believe that Professor Tobin is probably the most influential. His path-breaking study, Preschool in Three Cultures, which he will talk about today, has been widely cited and is a major text in most educational classes worldwide. It is quite unfortunate uh, to have found that his works have not yet been translated into Japanese. Uh, for me, they really show some of the core differences in perspectives and priorities across different systems. As a cultural anthropologist, yeah, Professor Tobin's methods are ethnographic, albeit with a methodological twist that he will discuss. But he is also powerful, I believe, because he is very astute theoretically. Having spent time in the 1980s with uh, Takao Doi, Professor Tobin has clearly shown how emic theoretical constructs, what other, others might prefer the term ethnopedagogy, can not only be understood but are highly generative for research. But I also believe that Professor Tobin has been a master of explaining these differences to a wider global audience. That is, his work, which uses a combination of videos and scholarly writings, have, been, have really opened up non-Japanese audiences to how different philosophy and practice can be in Japan. So we are also pleased that Joe accepted our offer. Thank you. And finally, we have Keita Takayama, who is currently Associate Professor at the University of New England in Australia, but perhaps for not very, very long. Arguably, there, have been, there has been no more influential scholar of contemporary Japanese education over the past decade than Keita. He has filled the pages of most major English language journals of education with a critical take on the status quo of research. He is now one of the leading voices in a growing theoretical movement seeking to challenge Western paradigms and publishing norms. Trained as a sociologist at Madison, Wisconsin, in both critical and postmodern paradigms, Keita has fruitfully combined history, sociology, political science, and post-colonial perspectives to offer a fresh perspective on Japanese education. As distinct from the other two panelists who identify themselves in the discipline of anthropology, which is a field, of course, dedicated to studying the other, Keita would likely identify with mainstream education and sociology, and by doing so, challenge the very dichotomy of the West as mainstream and the other as relegated to only anthropology and area studies. So, those are our three presenters. And just before giving the stage to Roger, one more minute, I want to point out that the combination of these three speakers gives us quite a range. Thinking temporally, we have about 40 years of experience with the Japanese model of education on the stage. Thinking spatially, we have perhaps the leading scholars in the major Anglophone countries, the UK, the US, and Australia. And thinking in terms of discipline, we have social and cultural anthropology, but also sociology. And each one of the three presenters are invested to greater or lesser degrees in education as a standalone discipline. So I hope in the panel discussion, we can tease out these differences as each approach definitely holds potential uh, for making the Japanese model more widely known in the global world. So without further ado, I'd now like to turn over uh, the podium to our first speaker, Professor Roger Goodman. 